The theme for Spiritual Formation Colloquium this year is imagination and hope. Our goal is to make ourselves available for the Spirit to stir our imagination and to fill us with hope. Imagination, it's the capacity to form a mental image of something. Images are powerful. E each of us presents an image to one another. There, there are things about our appearances we cannot control. But a few things we can control whether our hair is long or short or spiked or combed, whether we wear blue jeans or dresses, whether our glasses are round or square. We can control the vocabulary we use, how we present ourselves, and, and in so doing, we offer to other people an image that we want to portray. And others perceive that image we project and form images in their head of who we are we develop imaginations about ourselves and others. Images are powerful. They help us to interpret reality. They are both shaped by our values and shapers of values. Think about the image that we have of God. The scripture clearly gives us the prohibition Thou shalt not make any graven image, to borrow the traditional language. But Scripture provides for us some mental images of God. God is king. God is judge. God is redeemer. God is father and even the image of God as mother. But even these mental images can be a bit dangerous if we hold on to one and give up the others. They can get skewed. We've got to keep them in balance. Our imaginations project who we are and how we perceive one another and God and also create a way in which we perceive the world, the way we interpret reality. And there are different worldviews that people have different ways of interpreting imaginatively what's going on around us. And it's quite important that we choose a worldview that's healthy. The biblical account offers to us a biblical imagination. To be fair about it, the scripture is so complex and diverse. It has so many dimensions composed over such a long period of time that we might even need to say that there are different worldviews in scripture depending upon the different contexts. But I think from scripture we can find some overarching themes that serve as the keys to a biblical imagination. And I would offer three for you today that seem to me especially important. The biblical images of creation, incarnation, and reconciliation. These three seem to be pillars upon which we might build a biblical imagination. Perhaps the most daring act of imagination would be to imagine our own beginnings. And sure enough, that's where the scripture starts. Describing this chaotic mass of water that is both empty and full of swirling dark abyss. But God imagines coming from that something. And God speaks and there is light. God speaks, and there are rivers and oceans. There are mountains and valleys. There are planets and stars and galaxies. God speaks, and there are elephants and hummingbirds, whales and amoebas. And God speaks and says, let us make humankind 
in our image. Male and female in the image of God. And isn't it interesting that God who prohibit, prohibits us from making a physical image of God has made us physical representations of the image of God on earth. And, and this Genesis story depicts this wonderful, generous creation where we are made for relationships, male and female, given the, the capacity to join God in creativity, being able to reproduce ourselves. And I've noticed some of you are really on board with that lately. The birth rate in Logston's going up. And that's good. We need a new generation to come along to Logston. It, it, it's a place where we, we, we have responsibilities, but where the earth is so generous in its gifts to us. And we're given the responsibility to care for creation, to be God's representative rulers in this wonderful environment of mutual interdependency. Now, God says at the end, having seen all that was created, it is very good. You might be thinking, though, there is a third chapter in Genesis, isn't there? Chapter 3, where Adam and Eve decide they're not on board with this worldview that God has imagined for them. They want to imagine reality a different way. They choose not to think of this good world as generous, but rather stingy and they will not wait to receive patiently God's good gifts, but they will take what they want, that fruit that they think will make them gods, dissatisfied with being creatures. They want to be suprahuman and eating of the fruit, the result is they become subhuman, driven from the garden. But, but, but imagine them there living east of Eden, a place that is more chaotic to be sure, but a place that is still God's good creation. The rest of the biblical story is played out east of Eden, and it's a place where we are still able to have relationships, where we still participate as God's co-creators where though it is much harder, we are able to work the earth and the earth gives us its gifts. Still fertile, though much dicier in its fertility. It's a place where God is present with us and God's purposes can be realized. It is still, it is now a good, generous creation. But we know that there are some voices in our culture that have different sorts of imaginations about the world. There are those who think that the earth belongs to humans, not to God, and we can do with it whatever we want without consequences. There are those who imagine the creation isn't so generous, but a place where resources are scarce, and so we've got to grab for them before somebody else does a place where we should be takers instead of patient receivers of good gifts. In this worldview, other people are not imagined as neighbors, but as competitors, rivals, and even enemies. Years ago, Bill Moyers brought together a group of remarkable people for a conversation about the book of Genesis. Scholars, artists, writers. It became a mini-series on PBS. At one point in the conversation, Bill Moyers directs a question to Walter Brueggemann, the famous Old Testament scholar. Moyers asks him, do you imagine yourself living within the world of Genesis? And Brueggemann answered, yes. In fact, I can't think myself outside this world. And then he went on, but what worries me most is that my grown sons are opting for a different kind of world, another made up world of TV consumerism. Brueggemann's fears are well-founded, for there are clear voices in our culture that shout to us 
that life is fullest when we accumulate as many possessions as possible. The American definition of success so often seems to be the capacity to earn your own way, to gain more and more income so that you can engage the never-ending cycle of getting bigger and better and more of whatever you can. What might help us reject such a destructive imagination and embrace what Genesis describes? Well, I think the thing that might help us most would be to practice Sabbath. Sabbath keeping means that on one day a week you stop. The endless cycle of production and work stops for you and everyone else. The land is not worked, and Sabbath is a reminder that the earth belongs to God. It forces us to trust in God's good and generous gifts. It makes us stop and recognize our dependency upon God and on one another. Sabbath keeping calls us to the biblical imagination that we live in a good and generous creation. And when we imagine that and live into it, there is reason for hope. A second daring act of biblical imagination is the image of incarnation divine incarnation. God has not left this world to its own devices, but from the beginning, God has been breaking into this world, crossing boundaries into this world. The Old Testament has the stories again and again of how God is working in and through people. The story of Moses, who becomes the hand of God, leading Hebrew slaves out of Egyptian captivity. The prophets who become the mouths of God, calling the people to faithful community. But then there is that most magnificent, almost unimaginable expression of redemptive incarnation, which has come in Jesus Christ, who is described in this magnificent Colossian language. He is the image of the invisible God. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, to dwell bodily. God has come in human flesh, and it is the most magnificent expression of God's compassion for who we are and what we are about. The Gospels have this picture of the incarnate Christ who comes into the world with unconditional love and seems always to be moving to the margins, out there on the boundaries where people are broken and hurting, where they know they need a physician, they know they are needy, and Christ keeps going there to the margins to hurt alongside them and to heal their wounds, to forgive their sins, and to guide them to imagine living in the kind of world where we love God and love one another as ourselves. After the ascension, the community of believers come together and the Spirit of God comes at Pentecost and the church is created. And, and Paul's phrase to describe the church is that the church is the body of Christ. And, and we could understand that word body in the sense of the organization which belongs to connected to Christ. But maybe we should take it much more literally. The church is the body of Christ in the world today. Something of an incarnation of God today is the church when the church is at its best, when the church imitates Christ in moving to the margins with, with, with unconditional love to suffer alongside those who suffer, to heal those that we can heal and to point them to the Redeemer.
But there are those in our world who have trouble imagining redemptive incarnation. They don't think that God has broken into the world at all. They think that we are all alone, that we guarantee our own future. We've got to look out for number one. And those voices have lost a sense of responsibility for the common good in an unrestrained effort for self-centered accumulation. And sadly, this incipient selfishness creeps into the church so that sometimes those in the church think of themselves not as the body of Christ given for the neediest, but as a body entitled to privilege, a body that deserves respect and should have the power to impose its will upon others rather than to suffer alongside and woo to Christ those who need help to serve instead of manipulate. What can we imagine to push back against a destructive imagination that can't grasp redemptive incarnation? Well, maybe the biblical image that helps us the most is that scene from the last week and what we come to call the upper room. The disciples are there with Jesus. They're going to celebrate Passover. But Jesus, before they do, engages in one of his last lessons, an object lesson. And the object that Jesus takes is not a throne or a crown. He doesn't take a sword or a scepter. But it says he takes a towel And assuming the position of a servant, he washes their feet, even the feet of Judas. And it is a magnificent image of redemptive incarnation. And then Jesus says, this is an example that you should do for others what I have done for you. Maybe that helps us imagine not only redemptive incarnation, but being part of the redemptive incarnation of the body of Christ in the world today. And if we can live that out, then there is reason for hope. The third biblical picture I suggest for shaping a biblical imagination is the image of compassionate Reconciliation. Divine reconciliation is an old and deep image in Scripture. There from the beginning. In Genesis 3, after they sin, God shows up offering a way of reconciliation. The prophets imagine this magnificent reconciliation that bursts across boundaries. The book of Isaiah imagines when the wolf will dwell with the lamb and the calf with the young lion. Micah and Isaiah together imagine the day when people will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks and will learn war no more. And Zephaniah imagines a day of reconciliation when God will change the speech of all people into a pure speech so that they can call upon the name of the Lord and serve him as one. And what the prophets imagined came to be an awesome reality in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Colossians describes it this way. And through him, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace through the blood of the cross. God invites us to imagine this grand divine cosmic agenda, reconciling all things to God through the blood of the cross.
And yet, around us, there are those who imagine the world is different, not a world where there can be reconciliation. A world where people seem never to tire of drawing boundaries and building walls that separate us from them. Those who shout about dangers at every turn, dangers real or imagined in an effort to scare us into insulated self-centeredness. Those who never tire of criticism and conflict, who in a tragic antithesis to the words of Isaiah and Micah, call us to arm ourselves to the teeth, believing only violence can keep us safe. Maybe you've noticed that there are some within the church who buy into such a destructive imagination, who join in that kind of worldview so ready to draw lines between us in the church and them out there, so ready to criticize and argue and to condemn the other. But the boundary-breaking God of the Bible will have none of it. This cosmos is headed toward a destiny where every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we are invited to be part of that compassionate reconciliation. Maybe the biblical scene that would help us most would be to imagine again that upper room where Jesus takes the bread and changes the symbols of Passover so that he breaks it and says this is my body this is my body broken for you and he, as he passes the cup he says this is the blood of a new covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. The blood of a new way of reconciliation. So that when we gather around the table, we gather reconciled to God. And we take inside of us the body and blood of Christ so that we are reconciled to one another. And we go out to be reconcilers for the world. Another name for it, the Lord's Supper, Yes, but we also call it communion, being one in common together. Kifa Simpangi was a Ugandan who lived through the horrible dictatorial reign of Idi Amin in the 1970s when maybe half a million Ugandans were killed by that dictator. He survived and he became a believer. He tells in a book he's written about a spiritual mentor once who read for him the passage about about Jesus breaking the bread. And he said, Kepha, you want to remain this nice loaf of bread, don't you? But you, like this bread, have to be broken before you can be any good for God. Unless you are broken, you will be too proud to give away yourself for others. May we be the body of Christ willing to become broken bread and poured out blood for others. May we choose in our brokenness to break down the barriers around us showing to others the compassion that works the miracle of reconciliation. This window behind me has powerful images in it. We see the Bible, the cross, the dove. And this window is speaking to us, creating our imaginations sending them in a biblical direction. Because right in the center is the cross of redemptive incarnation. And and you notice those big black bands there? What, What do they symbolize? 
So sometimes when I look at it, it's almost as if the, those big black bands are moving out from the cross toward the edges of the window. And those big black bands sometimes represent for me creation. A generous creation. But then sometimes I, I look at it and the black bands are moving the other direction. It's almost as if they're moving from the corners of the window back towards the center, which is the cross. And when I think about it that way, those black bands are a symbol of all things coming together in Christ. All things reconciling through the cross. The window even says it to us. Imagine. Generous creation. Redemptive incarnation. Compassionate reconciliation. If we imagine it and live into it, then we become a part of the revelation of the mystery Colossian mentions. Christ in you, Christ in us, the hope of glory.